Hello everybody, I'm Michael Linke and on behalf of the Australian Institute of Architects, welcome to today's Lean In session. It's great to have you with me yet again. Today's Lean In session is proudly supported by the Institute's national corporate partner, Bondor, and today we look at practical considerations for roof design. There are a number of competing factors when designing for commercial or residential roofing in Australia, and these can change depending on where the building is located, of course. So requirements for roofing design in the National Construction Code are also often modified. So in this session, Glenn Roberts and Hamira Aryanpad will review practical considerations for roof design in different Australian conditions. They're also going to demonstrate static testing and cyclonic testing and failure modes using the Bondor NADA certified structural testing facility as well. I do want to remind you that today's session is being recorded and a copy of the presentation together with the slides that you'll see today will be available on our dedicated Lean In recordings page later on tonight. I'll add a link to that recordings page in the chat box below. So speaking of the chat box, if you have any questions today for Hamira and Glenn, pop them in there. And then like always, I'll go through them with the speakers at the end of their presentation. We're pleased to have two speakers with us today. We have Hamira Aryanpad and we have Glenn Roberts with us, both from Bondor. Glenn has over 30 years experience in the roofing and roll forming industry. And uh, he's advised on industry group submissions for a range of Australian standard up, standards uh, applicable to roofing and also for submissions to the roofing guidelines for HB 39. I also welcome Hamiria Aryanpad to the session today. She's a chartered professional engineer and she has over two decades of experience as an engineer in the building industry. Hamira's main experience lies in the engineering research, the product development, the technical solutions and advice field. And she joins me now as our first speaker. Hamira, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, today, I'm going to focus more on the structural aspects of insulated panels and um, Glenn will cover a much wider set of factors that need to be considered during the selection, design, installation and maintenance of roofing products. For those of you who may not be familiar with insulated panels, first we'll explain what they are, their benefits, various modes of failure that need to be considered, and I'll finish off with a quick demo test in our structural lab before handing over to Glenn. So the first question is, what is an insulated panel? They're also known as SIPs, which stands for Structural Insulated Panel. And they consist of uh, three components, the top skin, core and the bottom skin. They've been used in Australia for more than 50 years. Um, there are a few different core materials with different properties suitable for different applications. And the most common cores in Australia are EPSFR, PIR and mineral wool. There are two ways you can manufacture them. Firstly, by roll forming of the skins and putting it together. And the second one is by expanding the PIR foam at high temperature between the two profiled skins on a continuous line. So why insulated panels? Firstly, um, because they're very good in bending because of the high stiffness of the skin. And also because as the product becomes thicker, the skins move further and further away from the neutral axis. And that's where you want them because they're a lot more effective there. The sheer core and when you put them together, they provide superior bending and sheer um, stiffness to weight ratio. And yes, they're much lighter than a material with same properties if it was going to be made out of just the steel or just the core material. Because um, they're strong and lightweight, the cost of the structural members can be dramatically reduced. They're very good insulators. They've been used um, very effectively in cold room applications for many years, and they provide good acoustic values. And finally, the insulation is much more straightforward than built up systems. Just by way of example, if we pick a roofing product and just look at a three meter long piece of the top skin, um, support at both ends and we apply uniformly distributed um, uh, pressure to it, then the top skin will fail around uh, 0.7 kPa. 
The bottom skin is not very effective because it's just a flat piece of material. It'll take about 0 0.0056 kPa and the core will take around 0.4 kPa. Now, if we add these up together, we get just over 1.1 kPa. But when we put the materials together, the, the components together, we, we get um, around five times that capacity, around 5.5 kPa. So let's look at the modes of failure. Um, the first one we're going to look at is the bending and wrinkling. And um, it's more prominent in longer spans and it's governed by the compression capacity of the skin material, the effectiveness of the skin profile, um, the bonding between the skin and the core material because the core material actually supports um, the skin and the core grade and the thickness of the core. The next mode of failure we're going to look at is the core shear. This one usually happens at discontinuous ends near the supports and um, it's governed by the properties of the core and you can um, avoid it by reducing the span or selecting a thicker panel. The next one is the skin delamination. And this one is mostly controlled by good design and quality production in terms of the glue viscosity, set time, machine speed, temperature, and the pressure that is applied during the bonding process. But you also need to be um, careful with this so you don't, you don't want to expose the skin to temperatures outside the recommended range. Um, if the temperature is too high for a long period because it's used in an oven, for example, or with a very dark skin color, then you have the possibility of delamination that, that needs to be considered. The next mode of failure we look at is usually at intermediate supports of multi-span products. And it's governed by the diameter of the screw, thread per inch of screw. If you're fixing to a steel, then the base material thickness and grade of the structural steel that you're fixing to. If you're fixing to timber, the grade of timber and embedment into the timber. And you control this one by increasing the number of fasteners. And the last mode of failure we're going to look at today is a screw pull through. This one again happens at intermediate supports of multi-span products, and it's governed by the size and stiffness of the washer, um, as well as the, stin, the steel skin material, the profile, whether it, the um, material is infilled with foam, and it can be mitigated by increasing the number of screws and the effective area of the washer. Now we're going to have a look at our structural lab where we do our testing during the R&D stage to help us design the best product to avoid all of those modes of failure that we just went through. Just before launching the product, we also do some more testing to prepare all the support documentation that are used for designers, uh, by designers and architects, such as the span tables. As the product is used, we continue on ongoing research to improve the properties of the product. And as new standards are introduced or existing ones are amended, we test to ensure continued compliance. And we also do project specific tests when our product may be used in an application that wasn't intended for. And we need to test to make sure that it meets all of those requirements. So now we're going to have a look at a video we prepared for you earlier. R&D is a critical function of any forward-looking organisation. When it comes to insulated panels, not only are there so many factors that affect the capacity of the product, but also because of its eminent benefits, there are so many different applications that the product can be used for, all with different performance criteria. That's why a very significant aspect of the development process is testing, testing and more testing. People usually don't realise how much effort and resources go into the development process. Some of the main tests that we are continually performing as part of the ongoing development of our products and also as part of maintaining our conformance to the latest Australian standards as they're introduced are related to fire, thermal, acoustic, weatherability, and structural. 
Today we're going to look at our structural testing facility where all our structural tests are conducted. When it comes to structural properties, you do small-scale tests of the components to prove the concept during the development process. And when you have the final product, you need to do many large-scale testing for meaningful results at the required level of certainty. And in our case, these results are used for generating span tables. Just by way of example, to generate one set of span tables for one of our products, we will have to do around 15 to 20 non-cyclonic tests and perhaps another 10 cyclonic tests. This is a couple of months of testing alone, not to mention the planning efforts, all the way to the analysis of the results and independent certification that follows. Around eight years ago, we designed and fabricated our own test rig and obtained NATO accreditation to ensure quality and impartiality of the results for independent certification by external engineers. Over this period, the rig has been used full-time, fully dedicated to in-house testing and product development, performing hundreds of tests and giving us invaluable insight into the behaviour of our products. Test procedures to the relevant Australian standards collection and recording of pressure and deflection values and report generation are all fully automated. This not only ensures accuracy of our data, but also saves us an enormous amount of time, allowing us to do more and more tests. Today, we're going to perform a few tests to demonstrate the structural benefit of insulated panel compared to single skin products. We're going to test a metechnospan insulated roofing and compare it with a typical concealed fix single skin product, which would be considered for the similar commercial applications. First, we assemble the product. The cladding system consists of sheeting, fasteners and supporting members assembled together in a manner identical to the roof that the test specimen is intended to model. The product is on the rig and we're ready to go. To begin with, we look at the serviceability criteria under non-cyclonic conditions, assuming a maximum allowable deflection of span over 150. We're testing the insulated panel at double the span of the single skin product. Starting with a pressure of 1 kPa, we increase this incrementally and check the deflection. As we can see, the single skin product exceeds the serviceability deflection at 4.2 kPa and the insulated panel at double the span doesn't deflect much and in fact it doesn't reach the allowable deflection, even at the ultimate failure of 6.6 .6 kPa. Next, we look at some cyclonic testing. Roofing products need to be tested to the low-high-low low pressure sequence specified in NCC in order to be used in cyclonic applications. The purpose of this specification is to ensure the performance of the roofing system is adequate under cyclonic conditions. In other words, the cladding should not be detached from the framing or become windborne, which might cause damage to the surrounding areas or be a safety threat. In this case, metechnospan is double the span, but both are subject to the same cyclonic conditions. Here we're looking at the two products undergoing the same sequence. In this video, we won't show you the entire sequence, which takes several hours to complete. The test starts with sequence A, which is 4,500 cycles at the lowest pressure. Then the pressure is increased from 45 to 60% of design pressure and the cladding undergoes another 600 cycles and so on. We're now looking at the end of sequence C which then moves to sequence D. At this point the specimen is subject to the maximum pressure which is held for one minute. After that the pressure is reduced and we'll go through another 5,180 cycles. During the whole sequence, the test is monitored closely for any signs of failure, which may be due to fastener pullout, 
pull through skin wrinkling due to bending failure, shear failure of the core, or joint failure, and so on. The single skin product experienced pull through and rip buckling during sequence D while applying the maximum pressure. The insulated panel at double the span managed to withstand the entire cyclonic sequence. In conclusion, both products performed as expected and in line with the manufacturer's recommendations. This confirms that the greater spanability of insulated panel allows architects to design more dramatic spaces without compromising structural integrity. And the overall cost can be reduced by minimising the amount of structural supports required. Hi everyone, I'm Glenn Roberts, the second half of the presentation. Today we'd like to talk about some product and industry information we hope will be useful in the commercial roofing selection process. Certainly you'll be aware of many of the selection steps already. You do it on every project. I'm just hoping we can help you with a deeper understanding of some of the options and benefits of one type of system opposed to another. <clears throat> My intention is to be as neutral as possible in evaluating the types of roofing options. Single skin or insulated panel, conceal fixed or screw fixed. After that, we will look at a case study outlining the complexities of roof lapping and the best options to consider. Next slide. We will work through the issues as above as they all have an impact on roof selection and performance. Next slide. A good place to start, and I'm sure you're all quite familiar with this table. The building class influences a host of technical requirements and sets the so tone for so many other requirements on the project. Next slide. The project location and exposure to the elements will have a major influence on structural and external cladding requirements. Designing to the correct wind category is a big deal. From the stresses and cyclic shaking experienced during a cyclonic event, to the more benign conditions of inland Australia, for instance, mean a massive difference on how the building is framed and clad. Getting it right in the cyclonic locations could mean the difference between the building surviving the event or seeing parts of the building becoming dangerous missiles flying through the street. Equally, designing in protected locations could add unnecessary cost. Next slide. Rainfall intensity plays an integral part in deciding which roof system is applicable particularly when low pitches are required. The roof systems must, have, must be able to adequately carry water relative to the roof run length. Next slide. Water carrying capacity is about the cross-sectional area of the tray or valley of the profile and the velocity of water generated by the roof pitch on its journey from the ridge to the gutter. Higher ribs and wider trays carry much more water than the relative shallow, narrow valleys of corrugated. Profiles like corrugated and spandex would be poor choices for long runs at low pitches. And profiles like clip block or metechno span would be good choices. Next slide. Some, some retailers like Aldi, Woolworths and Coles are now utilising the underside of the insulated roofing panel for the finished ceiling lining. Others choose the older style built up system and a suspended ceiling. Both have their place and the reasons why we discuss a little further down the presentation. Next slide. What is the total roof run length? In many cases, the roof can be laid in one run but remember, each profile has its limitations relative to pitch and rainfall intensity. We have seen some major retailers standardising store design using minimum pitch and long roof runs. But remember, an 80 metre 
made it 80 metre roof run at two degrees in uh, pitch in Melbourne would be adequate, but it may not be, be adequate in Brisbane or Cairns where they have higher rainfall intensities. Next slide. What is the desired roof pitch? You'll need to consider more than just aesthetics here, as an overall roof height could influence activities inside the building. It could influence fire sprinkler requirements, and a higher pitch might be required to make the selected roof profile function with its, within its water carrying limits. Next slide. If, if the roof needs to be lapped, what system should you choose? What options are available and what are the key considerations choosing between them? The second part of the presentation focuses in detail on these questions. So we'll just park this here for now. Next slide. <clears throat> Is a pierce fixed roof or a conceal fixed roof system desired? Conceal fixed systems are limited to single skin products only. <clears throat> Excuse me, they are slower to lay and more care is needed to engage the sheeting onto the clip. But there is no doubt they offer a cleaner visual appearance and fewer fixing holes through the roof surface are required. Insulated panel roofing systems, on the other hand, cannot be conceal fixed. They must be pierce fixed through as the, pass, as the fastener passes through the top skin, through the panel core, and through the underside, underside steel face, providing a very strong and rigid roof. It's worth spending a little more time on pierce fix versus conceal fixed, whether they are single skin or panel profiles. Conceal fix profiles like clip lock or speed deck rely totally on the roof rib re-entrant engaging precisely on the corresponding locking point on the roof clip which is in turn fastened to the purlin. The sheet needs to lock precisely into place on the clip, making clip to sheet alignment critical. Screw fix profiles, single skin or insulated, provide less overall performance risk associated with roll forming variations or poorer installation techniques. My 30 years in this industry Reviewing various cyclonic failures, both on test rigs and in real life, has made me a little biased towards screw fix options. Next slide. Durability and sheeting stiffness determines likely deflection. The water ponding on a roof is caused by either the selection of the wrong roof pitch or by the sheet deflecting. This deflecting can be caused by a heavy foot traffic load, possibly walking mid-span, or it could be that the purling, purling spacings selected didn't allow for foot traffic in the first place. Once the roof has been compromised like this, there is no easy fix. It generally becomes a problem for good because no one admits to causing it. Either way, ponding presents potential leaks, and the reduction in service life of the roof. It's okay to design install dedicated walkways, as long as someone can control the foot traffic throughout the life of the building. Next slide. Roof pen penetration locations can cause serious issues with diver diverted water. Roof penetration is tricky. Placing them at the ridge or the head of the roof presents few problems because very little water is trapped behind them. Placing at the lower end of the roof, roof run effectively creates a dam that needs to be diverted to other trays. That's okay if those other trays have spare capacity, but sometimes diverting three or four trays of water from behind the penetration to one tray on the side of the penetration floods that tray causing leaks. So I said before, tricky. It generally requires hiding the penetrations because architects and their clients want to present the best aesthetics. It's still possible, but just need to choose the right roof uh, sheeting capacity or consider uh, air conditioning platforms that are fitted on less obtrusive feet, seen under the microscope there. 
Next slide. While the building class usually defines thermal performance requirements, recent changes to the NCC effect, effective May 2020 mean that insulated panel with a PIR core is required to report an age value, while the EPS FR core does not. Further details on, on this form part of a separate presentation. Next slide. This building is a good example of how multiple classes can apply. The main factory is class 7B, whereas the office is class 5. Do you use the same roofing and walling materials for both? What implications does this have choosing the right roof? Many large distribution owners are now increasing their thermal standards to provide better working environments, which translates to better productivity. Next slide. So in the opening slide, I said I would try to be neutral. Well, in applications like this, where a suspended ceiling is required to conceal services, it is likely that the single skin bulk insulation com combination would be the best option. It would be slower to install, but it would be cheaper and would allow concealment of services, which is not available in a panel roof. Next slide. Is temperature control required? Temperature control and air leakage are not the sole domain of cold rooms. It could be supermarket chains wanting to reduce their air conditioning costs, data centres and clean rooms wanting to keep contaminants out, or wine storage buildings requiring more stable temperature control. For these specialist applications, the single skin and bulk insulation combination really struggles. Obtaining a good airtight seal using multiple co components is difficult. So in this space, the single component rigid insulated panel is a much better option. Insulated panel offers better thermal performance because the insulating core does not compress during installation and the rigid panel seals tightly over connection points. Next slide. Perlin design. This is the area that can have the most influence over the overall cost of a structure like this. Matching the structural steel, Perlin and roof cladding systems is critical to the most economical solution. In my experience, old designs and Perlin spacings are often rehashed from previous projects without careful consideration of what new cladding systems might be able to do and what can be done to maximise the Perlin layout. Next slide. So oversimplified, but this is the sort of change possible by flexing from single skin to insulated panel for the same building. A serious reductions in Perlins is possible. The cost of the panel is more expensive than single skin sheeting, but labour is saved on the ins installation of Perlins wire, bulk insulation and spacing patterns. It all depends on your application, which solution suits. Next slide. There is no one roofing solution for every building. Single skin profiles have their place, as do insulated panels. I hope we have made that selection process a little clearer today. I would now like to proceed to the second part of this presentation, which is a case study on end lapping. Next slide. Roof laps, rarely thought about until they fail. This building pictured above is part of the Bondorma Techno site in Brisbane. Part of our due diligence when we purchased the building about eight years ago involved a roof inspection. And at first glance, it looked in pretty good condition for a roof 24 years old, until we looked a little closer at the old school roof lapping technique. Next slide. So old style sheet to sheet end laps present three main concerns. The first you see here where 
the multiple layers of tape or sealant are breached and the water becomes trapped in the lap and with strong winds is driven inside the building. Next slide. The second is sheet to sheet corrosion. That's daylight you see through a rusted end lap. End lap corrosion brought on by an interruption to the wet dry cycle causes premature failure and voids the warranty. Next slide. And the third reason is an inability to turn up the underlapping sheet. In the two images, top side and, and underside, you see a repair sleeve has been inserted into the corroded lap. This will extend, this will extend its life, but the same coating depletion failure will continue. Next slide. We talked about turn up. There is no better barrier to water ingress than the tray turn up. It is used in all flashing situations except sheet to sheet end laps. And consequently, that's where the most leaks occur. The three current options are sheet to sheet connection outlined on the previous three slides, expansion step joints, and new hybrid systems allowing connection over a single purlin. Um, next slide. I've just talked about that. I forgot to advance the slide. So just, just, just rehashing that sheet to sheet connections outlined in the previous slides, expansion step joints, and new hybrids allowing connection over a single purlin. Next slide. Here you see a typical expansion step joint. The principle is very similar for both single skin and insulated panel. Requiring upper level purlin cleats to be longer, allowing the upper level roof to overhang the lower roof. This method has served Australia very well over the last 40 years with almost all major shopping centre complexes utilising this system. It allows the sheeting in the lap to breathe and stay dry. Next slide. Here we see the latest hybrid addition to end lapping, allowing connection over a single purlin. Its, develop, its development was driven primarily by a need to reduce, reduce costs associated with additional purlins, flashings and labour, as well as the need for engineering and fabrication simplicity. The secure lap system patented by Bondor, the Techno, added a level of warranty protection not previously available on panel roofing. Next slide. In this slide, this lapping slide, we see the ever important sheeting turn up. The packer strip which lifts the upper level sheeting panel and the flexible sealing strip which incorporates the fixing plate. The sealing strip sandwiches between the two sheeting surfaces, providing the waterproof seal. Next slide. Before the secure lap system was released, it underwent rigorous tests by CSIRO to confirm its weatherability. An 80 kilometre an hour wind driven rain simulation saw the system pass without a drop passing through the lapping system. Next slide. Blue scope steel are suppliers to the major Australian roofing manufacturers and steel performance warranties are supported by them via the manufacturers. Both Bondor and Blue scope deliver a constant message erosion failure arising from sheet to sheet end lapping sections are not covered by warranty. Blue scope steel support both the hybrid and expansion joint lapping systems detailed here today. Next slide. So in summarising commercial end lapping, we recommend the tried and proven expansion joint. 
and the new hybrid systems offered by Bondor and the major, major single skin manufacturers. We do not recommend sheet to sheet end lapping. Next slide. In summary, today we have endeavoured to highlight some areas useful in understanding commercial roofing issues, including building classes, geographical influences, including wind and rain, thermal performance, span and structural steel optimization, durability and function of roofing materials, and product limitations and warranties. Thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. We hope you are able to take something away from this presentation. And please don't hesitate to contact us if we can help with anything at all. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn Roberts, and thank you, Hamira Aryan Pud, for that, both from Bondor. A number of questions have come in, and I just want to kick off, first of all, by really talking more so about the impending bushfire season that, without a doubt, will come back to hit us here in Australia. We've seen last week already a, a significant bushfire in New South Wales, and as we move into spring and then shortly thereafter into summer, this is going to be an issue again, hopefully not as bad as we've seen uh, over the uh, earlier few months that we've been experiencing. But as we move into bushfire season, a question has come in, and it's relating to this. In terms of recommendations to architects, and I'll let you both answer this one, um, what work are you doing, and maybe this one is for Hamira, what work are you doing in the research space for, you know, ember protection, thermal efficiency related to fire protection? What sort of work is Bondal working on in that arena? Well, in terms of um, BAL, we have um, products that are suitable for BAL FZ, which is basically the highest um, that you can get. And we also have some other products that are suitable for anything up to BAL 40. Um, and it all depends on the construction method. Great stuff. Um, now, I know just from looking at a recent press release, you're partnering with the University of Melbourne. Is that correct? What work are you doing with them? Correct. Um, we've um, got a grant, CRC grant, and um, University of Melbourne is our research partner. Um, we're looking at um, recycling and reusing of um, plastic, both within our processes and outside. And we're also looking at a few other projects, for example, um, real-time monitoring and incorporating of um, Internet of Things um, in our processes, not only to improve quality, but also efficiency. Okay, great. Thank you, Hamira. Now, a question for both of you. This is um, one that's that's come through on the chat. Um, this is just in relation to the panel products, and this is the million-dollar question. Is the core flammable? Uh, what's your response to that one? Yes, as I mentioned uh, before, we've got um, different products um, for different applications. Um, we've got the mineral wall core, um, which is um, non classed as non-combustible under the NCC. Um, and we've got the PIR, which cannot be classed as um, non-combustible. Um, however, it has um, very good fire performance. It's been tested um, to AS5113 that can be used for external facade of construction types A and B. And we've also got um, EPSFR, which, is, um, which has a fire retardant in it. So different products for different applications. Mm. Let's talk a little bit further then about the PIR. I presume that the reason it hasn't been classed as um, a fire retardant is because of the individual components that are contained within the core. Would that be correct? Um, not sure exactly what you mean. So in terms of saying, look, the panel itself is not classed as, as oh, um, okay. fireproof as such, because when you actually take out an individual element, you can still set fire to it. Is that? Yeah. Well, um, to, uh, to be classed as a non-combustible, you have to test to 1530.1. And um, we can go through that um, at another time, um, going through the fire test. Um, but um, we know that... Um, PIR would, would not pass that test. However, um, you know, as part of NCC, you don't need to have an uncombustible uh, product for every application. Um, therefore, as I was saying before, different products for different applications. Let's talk about acoustic implications. I mean, when you're building a, a large uh, design, I suppose when architects are compiling a, any sort of plans for material, there's a lot of reverberation, you get a lot of, um, you know, noise bouncing off. So let's talk about that. So what are your recommendations for, say, a rigid internal lining within typically large volumes? Is reverberation within large spaces, such as um, an indoor swimming pool, is that an issue? 
Um, I can't really answer that question. Um, you know, the acoustic performances are, um, are great. I mean, um, again, depending on what product you use, um, they, they range from 25 to 29, 30, um, but you can use uh, perforation to sort of reduce the, the um, reverberation as well. Mm. Um, now, Glenn, when you were talking about the purlins, you, there's a question that's come in from Michelle and it came in at that time. So I'm presuming it's relating to that question. And her question is this, does this sort of system require a performance solution in regards to satisfaction of the BCA for building permits? Uh, is that in terms, is the question in terms of, of safety during installation or what? Let's take that as being the case. What would you Okay, say? so when, uh, and we've had some recent questions about this um, just in the last couple of days. So when uh, the installation pro process happens, the contractor has to provide a work method statement on how he's going to install that. So that in part of that work method statement could be, for instance, particularly in single skin profiles, where they will have a safety mesh system installed first. With insulated panel, you don't use a safety mesh, safety mesh system. You use um, harnesses and lanyards to, to secure points as a fall protection. So there, is, there are different uh, installation work method statements for the two different products. Okay, thank you. Um, now, one of your reps, I think Andrew Hudson has ans answered this question already, but a question from Yusuf was talking about the panels being used for wall cladding. Is that possible in terms of utilisation? Roof panels? Uh, he's just said panels. Yeah, okay. So, panels. so we, are, we use it in a wall setting? Yes, the, the roofing panels can be used. They're, they're generally not because they're not aesthetically pleasing as the um, more... more uh, clean faced walling panels, but they, they can be used in that application. Mm, okay, thank you. Now, this is an interesting question, fresh in off the press from Jesse, who's um, viewing the program. And he says this, a silly question, but there's no such thing as a silly question. We're all here to learn. So how sustainable are roofing products at the moment? I mean, is this something that can be easily recycled? Are there things that Jesse should look for if he wants to do something that is more of, has more of a sustainable um, bent, does, how do they fare compared to older systems such as perhaps, you know, wood roofing, etc. He's also said mud roofing. What's your response to that question? Um, Hamira, I, you're probably more over the recycling qualities of the products than me. Would you like to take that? Um, sure. Yes, um, the products are recyclable. That was a nice, short, easy answer. Okay, great yeah. stuff. Thank you. I was thinking you'd go into a little more... Uh, <laughs> A little more detail, but you know, they are recyclable, good stuff. Let's talk about hail damage. We work in uh, and live in a country that uh, has many different uh, elements that face it from bushfire through to hail. Um, in terms of, this is a quick question from David on the chat. He says, hail damage, insulated versus non-insulated. What are the cause and what's the effects of uh, hail on those two elements? It's, it's likely that um, the insulated panel will suffer uh, less indentation because it's 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 it, 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 I guess you could say it has like a padding underneath it. It's less likely to to show the severe dinting that that um, would show on a single skin profile, but it would still there would still be damage. It's not impervious to hail damage. Okay. And now, in terms of where Bondor create and construct the the products for architects, uh, where are your sort of production centres around Australia? Hamira, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, we're basically all around Australia. We're in, um, we've got two facilities in Brisbane, um, two in Melbourne, Sydney, and um, Adelaide and Tasmania. Okay, great stuff. Awesome. So that's really it. The questions, um, that's all the questions that we've had so far. But um, I do want to say thank you very much to you both Glenn Roberts and Hamira Arian Pad from Bondor for coming on today. Um, and just as I'm about to close off, one more question. Okay, this is an interesting one. This is in relation to skylights in the roof. Uh, and a message from Perry's come through and he says, look, how a large opening, for example, skylights in insulated roofing panels cut and also can conduits for wiring be installed within the panels? What's your response to that question? Just say again, how, say the question again. 
two questions really skylights can can we cut out of um, bond or insulated panel can we cut in some space to put in skylights and the other one yes is, we can yep. we have conduits for electrical wiring installed within the panel itself we do we do have um, rebates in some of our products to allow mainly the residential type products to allow conduits to be um, concealed so there's actually a rebate in the in the lap where the two panels lap together uh, in uh, PIR there isn't a rebate um, and generally the uh, electrical um, systems don't pass through the roof. Right. Okay, no worries. Now, a question from Andrew. He's talking about box gutters. How do you detail box gutters with a panel roof? He thinks that the flashing detail would presumably get deeper proportional to the depth of the panel. Yeah, no, we've got, we've got complete flashing details and box gutter details, but the box gutter is details are similar to what you would use in a single skin roof, in a conventional roof. Um, it's just that some, some cases call for the box gutter section to be insulated as well. So it would involve having panels sitting on top of the box gutter brackets and then running up both sides as well. So it's a matter of whether, whether the client wants to insulate the, the box gutter as well as the whole roof. Let's talk about um, box gutters then and solar tubes. Is that can you use those two in parallel with each other? Solar tubes could could be cut into the into the roof. Yes. Okay. Um, and the box box gutters. What was the question about box gutters? Oh, just in relation to can solar tubes and box gutters be used in concert with each other? Yeah, well, you certainly, no, yes, they can, but you certainly don't have a solar tube in a box gutter, though. No, that's fine. Let's, um, let's quickly talk then about lead times. This is another question that's come in, just in relation to the lead times. Do they vary depending on the profile and the internal lining? Yes, they do. Um, there are different lead times for different um, products, but generally within a week or so of ordering, um, you're able to receive the product on site. Mm. And Let's also, talk. sorry, can I just add to that? Because obviously the products are manufactured here in Australia. Um, they're manufactured to order. So the, the lead times are um, significantly lower than importing. This is a question about delamination from Camden. And he says, have there been any long-term studies on the performance of the insulation adhesive? For example, you know, have we gone for a couple of decades, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it might be without delamination? Have you ever done any sort of long-term health of the product, I suppose, in terms of longevity of the product uh, research in your testing labs? Uh, we haven't, but the products have been used for, for more than um, 60 years um, in Australia in different applications, cool room applications, and we haven't had any issues. Um, so no research as such, but um, I guess in application, yeah, it's, been, it's proven itself. Great stuff. Thank you, Hamira. Now, a question from Jesse. This is a, an interesting one, and it's about public access. Why do people not use roofs as a walkable, accessible space? Uh, and um, is this possible? And I suppose how much more would that cost? I just imagine the noise of everybody walking on a metal roof might be somewhat excessive. But what are your thoughts? Um, more, more around um, durability and around um, safety. Uh, if you want people to walk on roofs, that you then need to protect the, 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 the roof edges um, from people falling off the roof. Um, and because of the roof rib shapes in the, in the roof, um, it would be easy to trip over on the roof as well. I mean, it's, uh, it's possible that you could walk on, it's possible you can walk on the roofs and not damage them, um, but yeah, not ideal. I suppose a roof is a roof. It's been designed for a particular purpose, probably not yeah. for a public thoroughfare is the most ideal design, I suppose. A question from Anthony on the chat. This is an interesting one, and um, I'm not surprised this has come up. We've all, uh, you know, seen a uh, horrific story that's come out of the UK with Grenfell Tower. Um, and his question is just in relation to getting your opinion on the core melt and cause collapse, even though it is fire rated. Anthony says on the notice that he recalls some concerns from the United Kingdom about that. Um, Hamira, over to you. What are your thoughts? 
Um, sure. I guess um, that's the uh, AS5113 that came about. Um, it was um, sort of a purpose to address those issues. Um, there are several um, factors that need to be considered when a product is tested to 5113. Um, and one of them is um, falling debris, for example. I mean, there are several factors. One is trying to limit the spread of fire above, below, and also to protect um, the occupants or fire brigade and falling debris and that is part of it. So you've, you've got to pass all of those criteria before you can um, say a, com non a combustible product can be used um, in, um, in facades. Mm. Uh, a question from Diego and this is just in relation to those architects that work in coastal areas and obviously salt erosion is a big thing and we need to consider when building what materials are going to be the most appropriate. So his question is, do you need a specific product or would you recommend, I suppose, a specific product for coastal areas and the architects working in coastal regions? Yeah, there's, there's certainly um, a higher grade of um, protection available for the steel skins, both top, top side and bottom side. And that would be something that we would be able to provide um, on a project by project basis. So some, some projects, we have done some projects where uh, insulated panel roofing was needed and they needed better protection. We used um, Colorbond Ultra, which has a, a higher protection of the base um, coil. So the, the, the coil protection is um, 200 grams per square meter instead of 150 grams. So yes, Colorbond Steel Ultra would be the, the, the right substrate to put on our panel. And I suppose my final question, in terms of your actual raw product, the steel that you get, where does that come from? Is that source? From the the yeah, from, from Blue Scope Steel. From Blue Scope, okay. Good stuff. So, so in that case, as um, you just pointed to it, obviously we'd go by the guidelines of Blue Scope. You have a fairly close relationship, I presume, with Blue Scope in terms of getting them and working with them to develop products that are suitable for different regions across Australia, I imagine. Correct, yeah. Yep. Okay, we great do. stuff. All right, well, that's the end of the questions from us here on the chat. I just want to say again, thank you, Hamira, Arian, Pad, and Glenn Roberts, both from Bondor. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Really thank you. Session. Thank there you. A, Thanks for the opportunity. Absolute pleasure. I will say that there has been a huge amount of, uh, of um, information provided, as always, when we ever engage with Bondor. There's a lot of information to sink in. So again, I just recommend for those of you uh, is on the chat, you will see it there. If you do want to go through the presentation again and view it in your own time, just to make sure that you've got all the concepts that have been presented, then please do go on to our Lean and Recordings page. It is there for your purpose and do feel free to look at that at your leisure. That is it for today. Thanks so much for joining me. It's been great to have you uh, with me for the last hour. Thanks for joining me. I'll be back again on Tuesday where uh, we're going to be um, hosting another Lean In, so do join me there. 12 noon Australian Eastern Standard Time to join me. But uh, until then, do stay safe and look forward to seeing you again on a future lean in. Thanks very much. Have a great day.